Welcome to yet another cross-border conversation, a Stir original video series. Today, Stir proudly invites two very distinguished guests. They both come from a language of in, 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 where they derive communication through their own language. We can talk, to, they talk about illustration, they talk about graphic design, they talk about communication tools, they talk about pride identity. At the same time, they talk about re revealing stories in the most comic and, 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 and amazing graphic illustration format. I welcome Shiva Nalaparumul and Tim Molloy. To start with, Shiva is a graphic designer, a type designer and illustrator from the Indian city of Chennai. He studied at Maryland Institute College of Art, Micah, under the likes of Ellen Lupton and Edward Miller. Shiva is the youngest Indian recipient of the Society of Typographic Aficionados Catalyst Award. His practice, November, focuses on identity, publication, exhibition design, custom typefaces, and interactive design. Earlier this year, he was part of STIRS curated um, annual event and an exhibition called Meteorology, where in collaboration with Indian street artist Hanit Qureshi to bring, a, bring alive an endangered script and insulation title, Saurashtra, which won a lot of accolades. Some amazing, interesting fact, as a child, his father made a deal with him that he would buy him books, however, ex however expensive, but not video games. Shiva, the naughty he was, he, he started deliberately asking for the most expensive books so that the father get dissuaded and says, okay, let me check and see if games are cheaper. But to his dismay, he always got them. Among them were scores of Tintin comics and he was obsessive about Tintin during his childhood days and that have greatly inspired his art. Welcome Shiva to Stir Cross Border Conversation. Hi um, it's, um Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor. Tim Molloy. Tim is a Melbourne based illustrator and comic artist known for his apocalyptic psychedelic art in form of comic books, paintings and sculptures. He published his first comic at the age of 17 and has and has dedicated more than 20 years to this art. He draws heavily on surrealist techniques, symbolist ideas, synchronicity and dreams to construct his stories. Recurring themes including death, rebirth, the nature and expansion of consciousness, self-destruction and discovery. He moved to Australia to pursue animation which he studied in New Zealand, but fell into dis dishwashing and playing rock and roll. Wow. After many years of both of those things, he finally settled to pretty hermit-like life, lifestyle, working on a studio at home where he shares with his lovely wife, funny and funny son and three cats. Behind his work, most notably, the Mr. Unpronounceable Adventures comic is a lifelong journey in search of meaning the secret thing behind the curtain. He was shocked at the age of 10 to find that he had not been baptized and he nagged his mother to initiate him and his brothers into the mysteries of Catholic faith. A crisis of faith and the doctrine of hell at the age of 13 led him on a journey that tra has traversed such na laden paths as an octillism, oc oc conspiracy theories, Uf ufology, atheism, nihilism, and now back to a sort of curious agnostic about hidden knowledge on higher dimensions. His comics have sought being a journal and of their journey, ultimately a lampooning of what he refers as his own fruitless armchair, Alchemal quest. Welcome, Tim. That's an amazing journey you've had. And I'm sure the both of you during this conversation, which share much more than what I have narrated. Welcome, Tim. Welcome, Shiva. Hi. Yeah. It seems that we're both um, big fans of Mobius. Uh, I think yeah, that's, yes. a, that's a good place to start uh, the conversation. For sure. Tintin as well. Um, I, I, I heard that mentioned in your intro. 
Um, yeah. Hergé is very early influence on me as well. So, um, so Tintin, basically, my parents um, were huge fans. Uh, and I basically had the entire collection twice when I was born. My mother's collection and my father's collection. Uh, and so it was the first uh, sort of stories that I heard. And I think that's the reason I began to draw and began to get interested in art in the first place. Because of Tintin. Um, and yeah. it's one thing that, you know, from my very early childhood, I still haven't kind of grown out of. Um, yeah. And plus the yeah. whole idea of the clear line style. Uh, I don't know the French word for it. That, you know, the line style that they call it. I think it's, I think it's just, uh, cl- uh, it's, I think it just sounds like clear line. Clear, it's clear, like lig- ligny. Ah, right, I'm not right, sure right, how right, to right. pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. And then, you know, of course, Mobius is the, is the artist that uh, everybody knows as, as, the, as the, the best at mm. that at style. That style. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, it's almost a shame because a lot of people um, will look at, look at my work and they go, well, that, that reminds me of Mobius. But I think that it's just that I'm really working in that style. I mean, you know, sometimes there are tall hats and things, the floating cars, but so many other great artists we're, oh, doing, yeah, we're working yeah, yeah, alongside Mobius at the same time, like um, Phil Casa and right and such, um, and the whole American underground, uh, Robert Williams, um, and all of those guys were. I mean, Robert I, I, Crumb. Robert Crumb, of course, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But you know, the thing, the thing that most people kind of forget uh, when looking at artists is they kind of lose themselves in the style, as such, kind of. It, it's it's almost this need to categorize, you know. Uh, so Mobius is, is, is psychedelic, and this guy is this, and this guy is that, and that that become that kind of takes precedence over what these drawings are really about, you know. Um, I think Charles Burns. When I when I think of Charles Burns, I don't really love Charles Burns. I don't. Yeah, I don't really think of the style that black and white, the shadow, but I think of uh, black hole as a story. And why that story really needed that style, you know. Um, even I would say that yeah. story wouldn't work if Mobius drew it, or Inkel wouldn't work if Charles Burns drew it. You know, I think these. I think your style kind of helps you gravitate towards the content that you want to draw, um, and uh, that is a very important thing that um, that people don't usually talk about in illustration when they discuss. Yeah. It. I- I, th- I think you're right, but I wonder sometimes mm-hmm. whether um, it's a chicken and the egg kind of situation, you know, right. like the, because, and especially when it comes to something like style, um, certain people like myself mm-hmm. um, have just, you know, I, I, I feel sometimes when I, when I look at the, you know, the, the slow climb up the mountain to, I don't know, somewhere in the foothill, foothills where I am now. I'm on the, foot, on the foothills, hopefully. <laughs> um, it's just a slow plod. With, and I've, it feels like I've only really started, I don't know, like getting better at um, examining my own style. But a lot of the time it's just, I've just thought of it as drawing better, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, and like definitely since I've started looking at Mobius a lot more in a, um, and they're like, I'm studying the way, for me, I always think about the way he draws rocks, you know? Right. It's like, I, I've, I've literally just looked at his work and gone, that's how you draw a rock. Like, that's how I'm going to draw a rock. You know, why right. would you draw a rock in any in other any way? Other way yeah. Yeah. Then that makes me think about what you do. Because um, right. that's literally what, what, a, what you're doing with fonts is every font is a different style. Like I, I was looking through what you were doing uh, what you sent me before with them, um, you know, like a whole bunch of different stuff. And it's, it's like, a, um, when you, when you're scrolling down a PDF, it's like, boom, 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 boom. And it's incredible to me when you, if you look at a PDF of my stuff, it's just like the same, but slightly better over, you know, <laughs> kilometers. You know, it's, it's weird. Um, time design is, is very, very, very uh, time consuming. And then you sit and like do a single letter for hours and hours. And uh, it's kind of the same thing that illustrators do as well. You guys, you know, when you draw a comic, you draw the same person multiple different angles and 
ways. So it's kind of the same thing, but it's weird that one person finds the other person's work harder. Like uh, I had a friend who, I mean, I have a friend who's an animator. Um, so when I'm drawing fonts, he would come in and say, I have no idea how you have patience for that. I'm like, I have no idea how you have patience for that. Like sit and draw the same guy moving like, you know, 500 drawings to achieve like five seconds. <laughs> So, well, as, as somebody who used to be an animator, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, on that one, the, those people are crazy. <laughs> so, I think it's just different <laughs> levels, I mean, different kinds of patients, but the same level of patients. Um, but is, is it just, is it still hard though? Like, I mean, you know, I, I'm getting to the point where I have days where I, where I find it easy to draw, you know, right. after 20, after 30, after 37 years of, Right. you know scoring those synapses deeper and deeper it's like <laughs> you know what i mean some days it feels like as i think about my brain and synapses and right. in a very unscientific way but it's like there are grooves in it right, right. right. and i sometimes imagine like when i'm on a roll with my mm. drawing you know like i i could feel it you know it's right. almost a it's not an emotion although i i'm i'm always like yeah good i'm happy then i'm happy but it's like it literally feels right it's the metaphor in my mind somehow mm -hmm. of like a little silver ball just rolling down that group, right, you know, right, right. No, not I, getting I, stuck in the... I know exactly what you mean. Um, sometimes it does, like all, all the kind of hard work and experience seems to pay off, like suddenly you're like really yeah. fast and all the ideas just come together. Um, yeah, that, that happens sometimes. But I, I guess, I reckon if it happens... Sometimes. Uh, yeah. But if it happens yeah. all the time, I don't think we'll enjoy it uh, what we do, you know. Uh, I think those challenges and those that kind of irritating why the why, you know why the fuck can I can't I like draw this a or you know a rock or whatever uh, I think yeah. that's really what pushes you into trying to do that even better. Uh, so but sometimes the, you know the fruits of the labor are good, <laughs> but most times it is far beyond reach. I'm reminded of um, being uh, you know uh, five years old right. when I was in my in my very first class at um, grade school or you know what, what we call primary school and down this part of the world um, so five years old and I did a picture might have even been a picture of my teacher now that I'm thinking about it it was either of my teacher or a self-portrait I'm not sure um, but she was a, a, a big kind of intense woman she's uh, very loud and and I was kind of frightened of her but um she loved this drawing so much and she paraded me through to the next class up, a bunch of 60 year olds and, mm -hmm. and was like parading me around and showing my drawing going, this is how you do it. You know, like, <laughs> be, right. like telling them off for not drawing as good as me. Right. Um, but that's, that's like a, a buzz. We were talking about the things that keep propelling us forward right. as artists, whatever we do. Like, I think I'm still chasing that high. Right, for sure. Like 30, 32 years later. Um, <laughs> and you know, like, it's never as good. It's never been right. as good as that. But speaking of style, uh, when you like the previous discussion, with type design, it's a very interesting thing because, uh, uh, so the, the two things that I would, I would uh, distinguish in type design, the subject, um, which is what the typeface is about or what the typeface is trying to achieve, like, whether it's a newspaper typeface or a you know, display typeface, whatever that is. And then there is the style. So the style is a much more subdued thing that I feel type designers can see in other type designers. You know, um, my friends would tell me that I have a very distinctive style. No matter how different my typefaces look, they'd be able to say that, okay, Shiva do this. You know? And I, I would be able to say that about a lot of type designers. And that is super weird to me. Like I would never be able to explain how. Um, it's not a set of features. It's not like the guy draws an S a different way all the time. You know? But there is that style really, really, really does come through in type design. It's just the way you draw or I don't know, the curve placement. But uh, any type designer would easily be able to see differences in people's like other designers styles um and i like that that kind of that kind of permeates through the subject and everything just like in illustrator right um, whether you're drawing a, a, a what do you say like apocalyptic comic or a, i don't know like a, even a children's comic a completely different style 
uh, mm-hmm. we would still be able to know that it was you with your line quality or the way you draw rocks, for example, or mm. whatever it is. Um, now, I wonder how that, that kind of comes through. Like, what is the scientific definition of that? The, the, it's exactly what I've been thinking about the whole time you've been talking. Like, I, you know, it, you know, I feel, I mean, that, that is part of what is so exciting to me about, um, you know, b- being a creative person and talking to creative people and doing what I do is that there is a mystery there behind it right. still, you know, like the very active, um, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day that the way that we sometimes just have, I have ideas that, and I'm sure that you're the same, like the, the best ideas come to you out of nowhere in the shower, when you're having a walk, when you're, thinking about something else entirely, like the, the solution to the, or even in dreams. I don't know. Have right. you ever had a dream about a font or, 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 or is it led? Is that... Not yet. <laughs> you might have, you might just not remember yeah. it. Yeah, That's the thing with dreams. Um, but it's like, where, where does, you know, where does that idea come from before it was? And, it, you know, often like, like a dream, an idea or a, you know, an image um, can be, or, or, or a font or, or, or some sort of design can be broken down into its pieces and then you can understand, ah, okay, well, this is influenced by this and this and this and all the way back. And, but then, but then the, the question is, well, where did that, you know, right. where did the thing that this was influenced by, where did that come from? And of course, you can keep going back like generations of, humans um mm. it's picking up things that are or bringing them in and like it, is the act of creation just smushing different things together and calling it something new or oh, i don't know I, I think that's what i'm chasing is to try and create something that is this is like a sort of background quest that i'm not really forging ahead with right. at the moment but in my life you know to get closer to that big bang kind of mm. feeling you know right. speaking of is uh, in that in that way is mr unpronounceable uh, sort of metaphor for you exploring worlds that you're not you know familiar with or don't know because he seems constantly surprised by things he finds in in his own world right um, yeah so he's is an outsider to wherever he is which is un, undefined as of now uh, and i mean he's an so, outsider to him to himself as right. well right, right. Uh, so in that way I, I find that to be a very interesting um uh, i don't know what you call it like it's like a, a device like a story device um hmm. for example if you see uh, rick and morty right uh, the story device there is that the guy is a scientist and there are dimensions and he can do whatever he wants which enables the writers to literally do whatever they want and just connect it back to science and it works um, yeah. So in that same way, the story device here is that he is an outsider in exploring a world that is surreal and kind of unexplained. So you can literally do whatever, like a box has a tongue and teeth and stuff, and it works. Like yeah. there's no you know uh, suspension of disbelief that is required. Uh, yeah. So in that way, you've created this device for yourself where you can literally do whatever you want. At the same time, you also have set the guidelines for yourself, right? The, whole, the world relates to itself. Uh, there's nothing outside of the rules of the world, as we can say. Even if, you know, as a, as a reader, I've only read a little bit, I can kind of understand what, what happens and what doesn't happen in the surrealistic context. So in that way, is, is, is the main character uh, a sort of metaphor for yourself where you are exploring, say, dreams or things of the unknown for yourself just through this character? in these weird ways? Uh, maybe. <laughs> no, I mean, yes. Yes and no. Like, I think it depends on the on the story. Like, I, and you're absolutely right about the, um, the setup for right. Mr. Unpronounceable. Like, it, it's kind of like a, a, a lattice work that I can hang anything on, you mm-hmm. know? So some of those stories are like just dreams that I had. Right. You know, literally just tr- me trying to translate a dream the best I can into some sort of narrative. Some of them are um, 
very pointed, like scripted, um, mm. you know, political, like some of them are about politics, you know, right. some of them are exercises in, cause I, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not very, very good at writing or mm. scripting. I, mm. I kind of tend to just move forward. Like, and then what happens, you know, it's more like, um, you know, uh, comedians uh, doing um, improv, you know, right. but I'm, but I'm doing it over the course of years, sometimes with a particular narrative. But then of course- Like a very like, long stream of consciousness, sort of. Like yeah, like, you know, like, it, it, I mean, some of those, some of those, some of the longest, most unpronounceable stories, cause they're all like different events that kind of interweave around each other. Some of the longest ones, in fact, probably all of the longest ones started off as like a three, three panels. Right. you know or, or like a page at most and then and then my brain for whatever reason um and i'm out of that groove now as well mm. I, like i've i've been sitting down i've been trying to write mr unpronounceable but it's i just i don't know i've got to find my way back to, right. to it because i really you know i really want to i sort of miss i miss that but um yeah it was it's i think sometimes that mr unpronounceable you know I'm really, I'm really coming to grips with um, my own sort of mental health at mm -hmm. the moment um, mm -hmm. over the last couple of years and anxiety and things. And I think what I've done is I've sort of like fallen into this sort of ad hoc kind of personal kind of anxiety therapy by making art like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's almost like I'm expressing that through, you know, like when you start having runaway thoughts, I got, I've, in the past, I've got very good at going, uh, maybe don't think about that. Think about what Mr. Unpronounceable is doing next, you know? And it's, it's almost like he's this sort of um, avatar in my own mind to right. distract me from my own bullshit. Um, right. I also um, have bouts of anxiety, um, but I have a serotonin deficiency, um, which was pretty much caused because of overworking. <laughs> So overworking, yeah. yeah. So I, I kind of uh, got diagnosed with it because of all, like you know crazy working hours and crazy amounts of work, uh, and so I needed to kind of slow down. Um, what? What? So, tell me what kind of long days you've been doing? Uh, not. I mean, this long was day. years back actually. This was when I was a student uh, in the states yep. doing my masters. So at that time, I would sleep, you know, once in three days or once in two days. And be Whoa, working okay. most of the time, not eat properly, you know, do all of that. <laughs> Student. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I did that for years, you know, for it to really manifest in that way. So, yeah, now uh, for the past... You're probably three, still tired from that. <laughs> yeah. So for the past <laughs> three years, I've been kind of trying to get a better process, uh, less, you know, obsessive. Yeah, it's hard though, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, like I, every night when I'm in the studio, it gets to sort of midnight and I'm like, well, I've got to, you know, I've got a kid, he's got to go to school. And, you know, up until very recently, I, I had a day job that I was going to as well. Um, it's uh, the pandemic has sort of um, jettisoned me into the life of a full-time artist. Right. Um, which is something I, you know, I can, I can see myself maybe hanging. I could, I could see... I could see myself maybe be hanging on to that job for years because mm -hmm. I was too afraid to take that leap. And then um, mm -hmm. COVID happened and because of schools closing and everything and our situation, it was just like, well, I can't work right. anymore. Right. Um, but it's, it's gone very well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? so, I mean, I, I'm been, sorry that there's been a pandemic, but it's been good for me personally, right. just in that, in that sense. Sorry, I'm coming in, yeah. um, Tim and Shiva. You know, we, you talked about Avatar and you talked about, so most of your work, Tim, when you create, you, you're imagining a character and you you fantasizing of a character and you bringing that to life in your, in your comics. Um, in, 
at the same time, Shiva, you have, I mean, I, like for example, Aurajit Sand, Sand, Sands mm -hmm. has been inspired from Aurajit Sen, you know, right. and a gentleman we all love. Right. So while some of your work has been inspired from a, a personality, uh, while Tim, your work mostly has been an imagination and a fantasy or an avatar as you talked about. Right. Have there been that you, Shiva, you've created a work which has been originated from a complete fantasy land and Tim, have you created a character which is inspired from a personality? Frank, uh, Do you want to go first, Shiva? Uh, yeah. So I think uh, Saurashtra kind of came from that. Uh, a lot of my work, for example, I too am very inspired by Mobius and Jodorowsky and that whole world of surrealist. In that way, I kind of imbibe some of that, some of those ideas into my own work. Um, I'm very, very interested in, in asemic writing, lost scripts, uh, uh, kind of asemic typography, which means a typography that, that doesn't really have any meaning other than visual. Uh, and visual meaning is a very important sort of. Um, so I'm very interested in the language of form as such. Uh, and a lot of my typefaces, if I... Um, can you all see this? And a lot of my typefaces kind of come from that place where uh, uh, I would consider reality uh, to be in this kind of world legibility or readability or kind of what something is supposed to be. Uh, recall, for example, is uh, a typeface inspired by uh, post-apocalyptic science fiction, you know, which is another genre that I really, really love. Uh, so I love John Carpenter, I love Blade Runner, ah. you know, William Gibson and all of that. And I tried to design a typeface. You like all the same stuff, Shiva. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I uh, kind of, I wanted to imbibe some of those characteristics. And one of the things in cyberpunk that is, uh, that, that's very distinct is this deconstructivist character, right? Um, there's this punkness, there's this uh, aggressive, um, you know, like a, usually there are these corporations or um, fascistic worlds that the, the protagonist needs to kind of fight against. Uh, so in that way, I want to create a typeface that, that kind of reminds you of some of that, some of that technology, some of that kind of alienness. So how far can I push an A before it becomes really illegible as an A, you know, that you can't. So this is, I think, as far as I can push an A till it becomes completely not an A, you know, um, with an R, etc. So they're completely deconstructed. Uh, but at the same time, I want to push it to another kind of level. Um, so we kind of created this other version of the side face. Uh, which is completely inspired by films and specific things. Um, you know, so this is obviously a very That's cool. you know, sort of, uh, it's more legible, smaller, the smaller that you get. For example, uh, techno, you know, like, so a lot of these influences like Terminator, Blade Runner, you know, um, Escape from LA, Escape from New York, and all of these things. So weird, I mean, when someone looks at a typeface, they would definitely not be able to say, oh, I can see, you know, um, John Carpenter and that. But that's not the point, really. The point is to kind of from where do these ideas come from and how do they manifest themselves into the forms of letters? So type design is very interesting because a letter can't change. You know, there's only so many different ways you can do a name. But that's really the challenge. Like how may, how, how far can you push those letters? How each curve kind of means something, you know? Um, yeah, for example, this, this type is, I think, uh, Tim would also like. It's called El Topo, inspired by the Yodorovsky yeah. film El Topo. So El Dobo is a, is a cowboy film. It's an acid western, as they say. It's a kind of weird, what do you say? Like a psychedelic version of a traditional western. Um, which, is exact, which is exactly what I wanted to do with the font. So western, the, you know, the, the traditional 
cliched version of Western fonts are these these kind of cowboy fonts, as they say. Um, I don't know if I have that. Right. No, I don't. Um, they are, you know, those. Um, I I can probably make it. A typeface that probably looks looks like that, you know, that has um, thick horizontals and very thin um, verticals. So usually typefaces are the opposite. So this one, this, this style is called the reverse stress, where the thickness is on the tops. So I push that to the very logical extremes where even the vertical is gone. It's so thin it's gone. And the sort of the, uh, the horizontals are so thick that this is as, as thick as we can get. You know, so if I were to type, um, Maybe yes, it'll be this really kind of hard and difficult and violent thing to kind of decipher. But at the same time, it very much calls on what Jodorowsky did with that film, which is extremely violent, aggressive, psychedelic. Um, and it's not very accessible. You need to really concentrate to understand what he's trying to say in that film. So uh, that's how I, I kind of would say that uh, inspiration manifests itself in type design. Uh, it wouldn't be in the same way that we would find in visual art or comics, but um, but yeah, it's in a much more abstract, personal sort of way. Uh, this is, you know, you made me think of this kind of thing um, with my, you know, uh, uh -huh. speaking of, uh, abs the amount of times that I'm asked, uh, you know, what does, um have you created a language, you know, with these sort of uh, hieroglyphics that I've created and, you know, I you know I think to myself, uh, mm. I don't, the amount of I'm I'm not I'm not Tolkien. You know, I don't have right. the time to create a language. That, right. That's that's an, I draw comic books for for Christ's right. sake. Um, but I, I've always been sort of fascinated with the idea that um, because I I came from a s surrealist sort of place um, originally. You know, like big Dali fan at the age of five um, mm -hmm. kind of thing. The, once I was able to sort of conceptualize what surrealism was and what it was trying to do and the subconscious and dreams mm -hmm. and things, the, just the idea that, you know, you can present something that looks like it means something um, at a cursory glance, but then when you investigate it further, it defies all right. reasonable explanation. And it, for me, the, the point of that is, is like maybe I will be able to give somebody else the same kind of jab in the brain that that I was given right. or have been given time and time again by, by viewing this kind of thing. Like what if we can throw rocks into other people's, you know, into the pools of other people's mm -hmm. minds and right. what, what ripples might, might expand, you know. Um, but maybe it's just vandalism. Uh, maybe it's psychic vandalism. I don't know. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, d did you start off wanting to d design type? Like, when did that become a thing that was? So uh, actually, I, I, wanted, I wanted to be a comic book artist, actually. Right. Um, so I went to design school because I wanted to make comic books and be an animator. Um, and uh, so in the first um, sort of, we have basic animation class uh, with, Vaibhav um, Kumarish. Vaibhav Kumarish is one of India's greatest animators. Like very famous. He did a lot of the MTV stuff. You know. um, so he was our, our, our faculty for basic animation. And um, so we had to do, I'm sure you know, uh, anticipation, what it's called. So uh, say like a character catching a ball and then kind of reacting to it and then like throwing it back, right? Or any yeah. kind of movement that involves an object or something like that. I don't really remember what... Um, I forgot so, what it's called, but I know what you mean. Yeah. So uh, at the time, that course, when it came, it was kind of my course, right? Like, this is why I joined college, to do animation. And all the stuff before, like, typography, like, drawing, and all those things are just like, whatever. But this is what I'm waiting for. So I was very excited. And plus, he, he's one of my heroes. Um, so super, super, super excited. And then we had to do this exercise, and I drew, I mean, I was very, very dedicated. I didn't sleep for a week. I drew hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of drawings. 
and in the end like scanned them spent so much time scanning each one you know diligently correcting it on photoshop putting it together <laughs> so it took two weeks to do just this thing and then i would hit play and it would get over in three seconds or four seconds <laughs> and uh, yeah. you know my mom would be like yeah it's pretty good nothing wait 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 no 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 there's something wrong like i could keep playing it and it would just just last that little bit and then i was like fuck this like there's no way i would do this for the rest of my life <laughs> <laughs> uh and yeah. typography was always an interest uh, so with me the thing is i've always been interested in so many different things at the same time and i just found type of thing graphic design as the best outlet with which i can work like tools you know so i i, I don't think um it to myself at least uh type of thing or graphic design to find uh what i do but what i do through them is really what i am interested in uh so in that way you know i think that's the same thing with it. any kind of creative practice no who chooses a medium um for example you have chosen illustration as a conscious choice to explore ideas that you were interested in because of other people's illustration but still illustration is still a, a kind of way to kind of explore your world right typography i've always been interested in because i i've been big into music since i was a kid and i i was in a band and all that and i guess you were too right you you mentioned that you were yes. on those yeah So we're on an indefinite hiatus. Uh, same. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years. Still together. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, so we used to play hardcore punk, uh, like Black Flag, Nick Cave inspired stuff. Um, cool. So that was another kind of outlet. And with music, the main thing that I was interested in more than I mean, my bandmates were very interested in the music, and I was very interested in the art that kind of. came with that it's like album art posters um, with band logos and all these things and so i used to draw these band logos all the time in my notebook and all of them were typographic like black flag tool or yeah like mega tech whatever and i was very very interested in that aspect so i think that was the earliest before i knew what typography was earliest i was interested in in that world. yeah that's that's totally that that makes so much sense um I, something jumped out at me um, with the um, images you sent me just previous to this conversation. I think there was some a little bit of a um, black metal inspired um, band logo. You know the way that the like the like Norwegian black you know true black, black metal, Norwegian yeah. black metal just that like that is Legendary. that is my definition of pushing things to the. Um, it's right. almost like it's almost like it's meant to. Um, so this is interesting as well. Like I. Uh, you know there's a um a uh a, a theory in occultism you know uh, sigil work you know i don't mm-hmm. know if you know about sigils and things but the way that um you you almost sort of break down the information to a point where it's indecipherable so mm-hmm. it becomes more powerful to the subconscious right. um that's an un- that's an of course an unproven untested idea but when it, sometimes when i look at um Norwegian black metal I'm like yeah. that's that's what we're talking about it's yeah. it's like it brands itself into the back of your brain and you're like oh like right, I feel right, horrible right. now like you know <laughs> something of it, it's like evil trees and blood and murder um yeah. but yeah it's but it's, know, it's like, a figurative version you know like uh, they're still very kind of descriptive about what they're for and against like we like satan and we don't like churches <laughs> so yeah. uh but yeah that that visual aspect of those band logos is crazy uh, shiva you uh, wanted the presentation i uh, you i think it was either in goa and hyderabad hmm. where you actually picked up programming uh, uh, support and and extrapolated all your uh, one of the font uh, would you like to show that on a screen it was that was interesting oh, yeah. absolutely um so this is a type is called calcula um which is my first type is actually first one that i started working on but it took 3 and a half years to finish um it has multiple kind of styles so shadow so what what happens in it is that it kind of understands what you're going to type um and it adjusts itself like for example if i write p and then l the p kind of adjusts itself and then the a oh. adjusts itself 
you know. Wow. You know, so it, it all so cool. kind of puts itself together, like, boy, you know. Um, and something like what you do for your for your comic, right? There's an O in yeah. the beginning. But. Yeah. <laughs> So um, a comment, a comment is going. Like, that is so cool, right? So, um, what do you say? Like platelet. So it it will never, it will always kind of adjust itself, you know. Uh, it's, it's cute, um, and then it would work with all these different styles as well, like three D shadow and so on. So say you have this. And this is um, say red, right? And then this is black. Um, and we do the shadow, we put them together, and then you have you know layered different colors. And you can change the color over here, and it would still work. Um, so the idea here is that it's ligatures. Um, for example, this is one letter, and this is one letter, and then this is one letter. You know, so this is actually one glyph. You can't choose the A separately, in a way. Uh, um, so usually a typeface has um, 300 to 400 characters in the Latin script, but this one has like thousands. You know, just keep going <laughs> on. <laughs> um, and of course, it does the same thing with with lowercase as well. Um, you know. So. Every possible permutation is already worked out in advance. It's not yes. doing some sort of pretty much. Wow! As in, to to the best of our ability, you know, there's no way. For, tomorrow, if someone were to create a, a word, um, there there won't be any way the typeface would have that information already. Uh, but yeah, we've created words that will never ever get sort of. Um, you know, written <laughs> like this. That's insane. But I'm so glad that you did it because it's so awesome. That's really cool. Thank you. But uh, but yeah, so this this was programmed by by Tal Lemming, who was my teacher at the time as well, uh, who is an amazing programmer and type designer. So half of this um, half of this typeface is built by code and half built by drawing. Mm. So basically, the idea is that I would draw. Um, all the different variations. For example, this is a K. That would happen if there is a L, sorry, L, and then K, and then T. You know, so this K would happen if this, you know, um, combination would happen. So I would draw each of these things separately, 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 and then the Python programming would put all of them together, like it would create this. And then we would go in and edit this uh, separately to see if it works and so on. So uh, half programming, half drawing. So in that case, I could have learned the programming to do it myself, but I would have, you know. Well, that's a tack on another two years to the project. How long did you say that it took you? Uh, it took three and a half years to make. Wow. Which I think is nothing for comic book artists. You guys take a lifetime, right, to make <laughs> comics. Yeah, so. but I mean, like, I, you know, I, uh, it, you know, three years for a comic book, you know, I'm at least traveling to different locations and you know what I mean? Like the yeah, dedication yeah. required to do, to do that. Like I would have, um, I would have given up font work. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So back on the time, I mean, Mr. Unpronounceable Adventure took 10 years to finish while you were at that book. Um, were you doing any other parallel book or conceiving any other subject or, or, or stories? Um, the the Mr. Unpronounceable comics, it's, it's three books, holding them up there. Uh -huh. So um, the, the first one, Adventures, is, uh, was the sort of a collection that my publisher wanted to do that, ex that expanded. Because once I was like, well, could I do some more stories? Because they were, I'd, I'd done them. So over that ten years, there was probably a good four years in between where I wasn't doing Mr. Unpronounceable. Um, however, you know the um, the last one, um, 
which is the in, in, misdownpronounceable in the infinity of nightmares. Um, that was all I did for two years, I think. I, I don't think I did anything else. Um, I might have done a few illustration jobs here and there. Um, I was also, uh, you know, um, raising my 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 little boy. You know, I, you know, he was. Um, is it this one? The it's the one before. Um, this the sector of the bleeding eye. You know, is dedicated to. Um, hold that up there. Um, my little mm -hmm. picture in the front. Oh, nice. So, so this one was done. This this book was sort of conceived of um, when he was. Uh, in utero and then a, a baby and I, I was the um, stay-at-home parent for uh, after sort of uh, you know uh, th three or maybe I think my wife went back to work um, I think he was like six months old or even five months old so I was I was working on this while I was taking him to the park and mm -hmm. um, I know this is off the topic of creative pursuits but it it's it's funny how these big projects um, actually anchor themselves to these other parts right. of your life, you know, these heavy sort of heavy loads, heavy emotional loads. Um, so it's, if, if that's the tangent I seem to be going on, you know, it's, it's funny to, to think of that book in particular, which is very, it's pretty dark, you know, it's all about sort of, you know, a, a, a heretical cult kind of um, taking over the, the city which deserves to be taken over, to be honest. There's muddy morality, all kinds of things like that going on. Um, One thing, I mean, when, when you, when you're putting stories together, there's a lot of delusion, confusion, mystery, you try and add to um, your, your, your way of communication. I mean, if you're gonna play it on mystery, you're gonna create confusion, that's, that's, uh, and you, that's our fantasy world, and that's how, you know, dreamlike world, which may not be completely real, is what you're working upon, and when you're talking to the audience, or when you, the audience is reading uh, your work or, or looking at your work, um, that's the trigger you want to give them. They listen. This is all mystery. This is all fantasy. But on the other hand, Shiva is turning some part of fantasy into reality. You know, um, through yeah. communication language. You know. So, uh, I mean, for how long? I mean, yes, we were talking about. Uh, uh, you know, where in, in every aspect of architecture, design or art, there's some people play with turning uh, dreams into reality. Well, in your case, you're actually turning reality into dreams. Have you flipped around and taken a reality and then created a mystery and confusion around it? Like inspired from a true story almost? Yeah. Are you talking to me about yeah. something yeah. inspired by yeah, a story? I'm, I'm asking. Um, no, although, well, you know, I mean, I, th I think what, uh, you know, what it makes me think of is something that a lot of comic artists do and I have done is um, you know, the, the most fascinating true story that any comic artist um, worth the soul is considered is the autobiographical comic. Um, which is almost a cliche. And I have done a few of, few of those um, way back in the day. Um, but I have other, um, you know, un, unwritten experiences that I, I had. I had a big project, which was going to be all autobiographical um, comics, you know, about my own life. It's, you know, I've had some strange things happen to me. Um, I was going to make them stranger for the page, you know. Um, but in in the end, I think, like Shiva was saying before, you know, some of us are better at certain things than others and we just gravitate towards those things and find our niche. Like, I'm not really interested in, like, presenting the, the tr like, tr trying to present the truth um, in a concise way. I, I don't know. I, I just, I always, I always find that the, the way forward for me is, you know, to, to the truth or whatever it is, is sort of almost like 
all right, the truth is somewhere in front of me. Um, what I'm going to do is turn around 180 degrees and go in the opposite direction and go all the way through the, you know, the other side and come around behind it, you know, and see what, what, uh, maybe I can catch the truth unawares um, through these various sort of processes. Because I, I think the thing is, like, I don't know what, the, I don't know what the truth is. I don't know what um, is, I think it comes, I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to find my, my words for this because it is sort of a, a tough, I've made it a tough question. I would find it hard to go, what am I going to, what story, what, what particular part of human history, um, or indeed even my own life, am I going to spend the next two years uh, doing? You know what I mean? Like, my brain is not... It's very focused when it comes to like what I'm what I'm doing, sitting down and making a project. But when it comes to what I'm interested in, it's very difficult um, for me to to hone in on one thing that that will hold my attention for that long. I think um, that's a terrible answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you hear yourself just rambling, going. I, I hope at some point what I start to say means something. Um, but there you go. Yeah. I'm a fantasist. I'm, I'm a fantasist, I think. I think I've, I've become comfortable with that. 